Today's show, we've got some really new stuff, and we're going to talk about crossovers, active and passive crossovers, what they are, why they're good, what's bad about them, etc. Okay. So Gavin in Taipei, Taiwan, and he writes, Hey, Paul, a friend of mine invited me to his house to listen to his active crossover system. It was astonishingly good. So I bought an active crossover. I bypassed the passive crossover in my speakers and also bought two four-channel power amps to power my three-way speakers. And it's so good. Much better resolution, much more dynamics. But most of my audiophile friends don't use active crossovers, relying instead on the passive crossovers built into the loudspeaker. Um, it's just, they say it's too much, it's too much money, uh, and also some people are concerned about phase coherency. So, Paul, what do you think about active crossovers? Well, let's first talk about what a crossover is in this context and, and what we're wanting it to do. In a loudspeaker, we have, in its simplest thing, let's take a two-way loudspeaker, you've got a tweeter and a woofer, right? Now, you don't want the tweeter to, to try and reproduce bass frequencies because that will cause distortion in the tweeter. So you don't want to feed a tweeter a full range signal. So what do you do? Well, you have to cut off the bass so that it only tweets what tweeters should do. And the same can be said for the woofer. You don't want the woofer trying to play the, the, the signals that the tweeter should be playing. So what we do about that is we add a crossover. Now, in the case of a tweeter, it's usually just a simple uh, capacitor that we put over. As we've talked earlier in our earlier programs, capacitors are devices that, depending on their size, their value, will pass certain frequencies while rejecting others. And the smaller the capacitor, the less low frequencies that it'll pass. Any decent capacitor will always pass high frequencies, but it's the amount of low frequencies and the cutoff point where those low frequencies that it is allowed to pass uh, are what varies with the size of the capacitor. So that's a, usually a very simple circuit, just a capacitor in series with the tweeter. The woofer, a little different. Here, we need a different element to roll off the top end and that's usually called an inductor. An inductor is a coil of wire, uh, and maybe it's got some iron in there to make it work a little bit better. And as the frequency goes up, the uh, as you have you know a base frequency that you don't want anymore, that inductor will start rolling off the top end because inductors do the opposite of capacitors. So that's your basic simple crossover. And from there, we we can have uh, mid range which uses both elements of an inductor and a capacitor. And we could have a four-way or a five-way. There's any number of ways that we can roll off and tune individual drivers within a speaker so that each driver does what it is best at and doesn't try to do what the others should be doing. So that's your basic crossover, and that's what we would refer to as a passive crossover inside a speaker, a collection of capacitors, resistors, and inductors with inside the box of, of the speaker box. An active crossover is external, typically, to a speaker. And, and here, we might have a very different scenario, although with the same goal. An active crossover is an electronic device that uses typically those same capacitors, inductors, and resistors, but we do it in a little different uh, manner with active elements, usually op amps or discrete circuitry, that make for a better acting crossover than we could get with just passive components. And each output, let's say if you had a simple two-way active crossover, then you'd, you'd be able to have the tweeter and the woofer, and you would have separate outputs that would feed separate power amplifiers. And so then that power amplifier, that tweeter power amplifier, would feed directly the tweeter, and it would have the same response that we had with the passive. So that's the difference between an active and a passive crossover. Now, why would one choose? Well, obviously, 
the easiest way to make a speaker that is a complete unit that I can just ship to a customer who hooks it up to his power amplifier is to build passive components inside. Therefore, everything is locked down. If I want to sell you a speaker and in order for you to make it work, you've got to go out and buy multiple power amplifiers and an active crossover. Well, yeah, I mean, you're really limiting the market of what you want to do. Every speaker designer I've ever met, uh, from me to Arnie Nudell, would all like to build active crossovers with multiple amplifiers of our own choosing into the box that we would call a speaker. Active speakers are ultimately always going to be better than an external amplifier with a passive box. The problem is they don't sell very well. People want to hook their own stuff up. They want to say, well, I like this amplifier. I already have this amplifier. They don't trust active speakers. So from a commercial standpoint, we don't do that very often. So they can be better. I think every designer I've ever talked to would like to do it, but they don't because it doesn't sell. Circling back to the original question, why most people don't do this and, and do they sound better? Well, it takes a certain amount of skill. If you take a speaker that was originally designed, and a good one, to have a passive crossover that's separating frequencies, and you rip that crossover out and build your own, you're really entering into territory that is very difficult, that takes people years to learn how to do, and is very hard to duplicate what was in that speaker in the first place. So that's why most people stay away from it. You don't know that that's the way the designer wanted it to sound. And if you can get it to sound great and work for you, go for it. More power to you. Thanks for the question.